agreed, at least to some extent, a very large number of scientific papers. Mm -hmm. uh, I almost never read a paper through from start to finish. I just don't have time. Uh, and so the, the question is, how fast can I get into a paper and decide, has it got what I'm looking for or something relevant to what I'm writing about at the moment? In my case, I think the first thing I, I look at uh, is the, are the pictures and the graphs and the tables uh, in the results section. Uh, if that's not, if that stuff isn't there or isn't relevant, uh, then I go on to some other paper. In terms of my reading, the caption is important. That's those are the first words, actual words that I read. Uh, I hate ones that say, "For details, see text" or something like that. Well, I mean, you always see the text for the details. Now, nice self-contained terse uh, figure legends are a real joy. If uh, that stuff looks interesting, then the first thing I want to know is was the stuff arrived at by some method that's relevant to what I care about? So I read the rest, I actually read the words of the, of, of the results, you know, how'd you get that graph? And uh, if that looks good, uh, then I will very often go back and read uh, at least parts of the methods. Sometimes I turn to the bibliography right after looking at the results, looking at those pictures. Uh, you can tell whether somebody is off the turf or on the turf by what the paper itself has cited. Mm -hmm. If you do a thesis, undergraduate, graduate, whatever, you really want to show the readers that you know the literature. So you do a review that is nothing if not thorough. Every source you've seen, you cite. When you do a published paper, you cite only those that are directly and immediately germane to what you're doing. And theses tend to have, good ones have uh, longer and more interesting introductions. I mean, they are reviews. Uh, scientific papers, as accepted by journals, are, are not reviews. My pet peeve about the theses, are getting ones where there's an introduction that is enormously general, it, 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 uh, but never really comes to grip with exactly what that paper is going to do and how it fits into things. To me, a, an introduction is a, you know, it has really three parts. You set the stage by saying, here is the state of the art, this is your review. You precisely formulate the question that your particular project is addressing. And then you give the tactics of how you're going to address the problem. And it's really those three parts. Sometimes you ask the question first and then do the review. Sometimes you do the review first and ask the question. I like to ask the question first because, you know, be upfront about where you're going. But that's, you know, not critically necessary. Uh, but it's three parts. The state of the art, the exact question, and the tactics with which you're going to approach the question. I think people have trouble separating what's results and what's discussion. And I think the simplest rule of thumb I have is if you have to refer to anything in the literature, it's discussion. Uh, results is what you did. And just as a, as a general rule, no citations in the, in the results. If you need a citation, think about putting it in the discussion. That's where you take your results and integrate that with what other people have done. Don't confuse the results. A scientific paper is not honest history. Uh, it's not a, a record of what you did on day one and then day two and then day three. Uh, it, it, it's a, a sci historically, it's a fraud. It's a complete fraud. Uh, and we know we're perpetrating a fraud when we write a scientific paper in that historic sense. The reason we do it is it keeps the literature tidy. It's tremendously helpful for guys like me that have to read a lot of literature. I don't want to hear all the problems you had and all the things that didn't work. Although once in a while they might actually be relevant, but mostly I'm just as well off not knowing about that stuff. So what you're allowed to do is to reformulate the hypothesis at the end and say, this is what I aim to do, and actually isn't what you aim to do at all. But it, 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 you, you impose a storyline after the fact. Uh, we all do it. When you, you know, it's, it's very easy to start doing research and have this terrible feeling that, oh my god, I'm blundering awfully. I read all these papers in the literature, and those guys, I mean, those people, they set out to do this, and that's exactly what they did. You know, and me, I'm blundering all around. Well, the truth of the matter is, the other guys 
they blundered around to maybe a little less. I mean, you get better with age and experience. You want to keep it crispy clear for the person who just doesn't happen to have English as a first language. I mean, we are uh, extraordinarily blessed by having most of us been uh, are given a birth language, which is now the world sci premier scientific language. How is the, the, the person in Bulgaria who's reading English with great difficulty in a dictionary going to do with it? No jargon, you know, straightforward, short, terse, clear sentences, uh, no literary flourishes, which I love, but I try to keep them out of my papers. Uh, puns, only if they're the, not going to impose themselves on someone who really doesn't get the pun. This paper that you're writing should be readable 50 years hence. Uh, that means you want to keep out uh, very much in the way of manufacturer's jargon. Uh, you want to keep out uh, acronyms. You want to keep out these abbreviations. Okay, the word DNA is going to be around, but how about GFP? Uh, green fluorescing protein? Will somebody recognize that in 50 years? Probably not. This format we put things in. Uh, introduc again, introduction, uh, materials and methods, uh, results, discussion, is actually not very old and uh, is not necessarily universal. It seems to become kind of you know, etched in granite uh, in, say, the last 20 or 30 years. Uh, I think when you write a paper, it's still permissible, and journal editors will not necessarily always fight back if it doesn't cast nicely into that format. Now, I happen to like the format. I think if you're going to pick one, it's about as good as you can do, and it's very, very nice for someone like me that has to go through a lot of papers, and I want to get to the guts of the paper as fast as I can, and the fact that they're all in a stereotype form is a, is a real uh, blessing. It's, it really makes my life easier. But sometimes it doesn't fit, and I've seen a number of papers that have been, you know, squeezed and bent and twisted out of shape just to force them into that, into that format. And using lots of subheadings, that's another bit of advice. You don't have to have just introduction. You can, you can proliferate subheadings. You're writing for a reader who's already read five papers. Uh, his or her mind is already pretty addled and, and wants to get at what, you know, the particular thing the reader is looking for right away. Subheadings are great, and they can help that sort of problem a lot. One ought to write up a paper as soon as possible after one does the work. Most of us much prefer doing science to writing. It only gets harder with time. Uh, your research notebooks get less and less understandable. Uh, you just get this kind of distance, things that you for sure knew about what you did and how you did it suddenly aren't there in your head anymore. You know, get down there to the words and write the damn thing up.